So people transplant the progenitors in the hopes that two things might happen. They could stimulate the injured brain to recover because they're secreting things right. that, um, the, that, that might be like growth factors. The second thing is they could themselves directly differentiate into neurons or glia mm -hmm. and replace damaged circuits. Right. So those are the two goals. Okay. And they use progenitors simply because they're not, it's the next stage away from a stem cell. Right. And so properly speaking, if we were, when people talk about brain stem cell therapy, it's mm -hmm. really progenitor cell therapy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UCLA Brain Sport Podcast. And today I've got a very interesting guest with me, Dr. Stanley Carmichael, chair of the Department of Neurology, uh, accomplished researcher in the field of stem cells, brain injury recovery, and a whole lot more, um, and an avid backpacker. I told you I was going to say that, and I did. Um, so today we're here to talk about stem cells. Thanks for coming. First Thank off. you for I mean, having me. I mean, it's a pleasure very, to be here. Very, very busy. Yeah. Um, so I think we should just get right into it. Today we're going to be talking about stem cells, um, specifically in the context of brain injury recovery. Your specialty is stroke, um, but I think you're pretty familiar with maybe some of the traumatic brain injury literature too. We'll get into that. Um, so we'll talk about stem cells. We'll talk about what stem cells are, um, the evidence for use in brain injury, how it works in the context of brain injury. Maybe we'll get into some spinal cord stuff if we have time. And then um, you're also doing some more research on um, a specific molecular target for brain injury recovery called the CCR5 receptor. Um, this is separate from stem cells, but I think in my personal opinion, equally interesting. So we'll definitely cover that. Um, but uh, first off, I think uh, it's important to talk about stem cells because for a couple of reasons. I get asked about stem cells all the time in clinic by my traumatic brain injury patients, ranging from concussion all the way to severe traumatic brain injury, right? Um, also, there is an element of self-interest doing this podcast with you because I'm really interested in the science of stem cells. It's just like really personally interesting to me. Um, and then, you know, and then the other reason I'll, 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 I'll make a point as to the other reason uh, through a patient encounter that I had. And this patient encounter was a, I think it was a, a 16 year old kid um, that was healthy, um, you know, a stellar at school, was an athlete sociable kid, likable kid. Um, and then unfortunately, I think he fell from like the fourth story of a balcony accidentally, landed right on his head out of severe traumatic brain injury. Um, and he saw us six months out from that. And obviously the parents were really, really devastated. And uh, they were looking for all sorts of alternative therapies. And they came upon someone that, you know, was claiming to be able to administer uh, stem cells and was also making claims as to the kind of miraculous recovery that um, their son would have. And, um, you know, initially a nurse, um, it, it cost $15,000 per treatment and they did two treatments. And the first treatment, a nurse came to their home, uh, got an IV access for their child and then infused what they claimed was stem cells. And then the second time it wasn't the nurse, it was, you know, the individual that, you know, they had contacted for the stem cells. He came to their home, tried to get IV access, couldn't get IV access. So then just decided to sort of stick their child in the neck and then inject what he claimed was stem cells. And that was it. And then they were coming to us uh, wondering, you know, was that the right thing to do? What are some other things that they can do? And I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying that it wasn't stem cells or it wasn't the right sort of treatment or decision on the parents' part, but I think that's just a testament to, you know, it's rather suspicious, I think, um, especially just sticking him in the neck like that. And I've seen a lot of that where people are claiming stem cells can do certain things that maybe the science, um, you know, doesn't substantiate. And you mentioned you've had experience like that too with, with some of your patients. Yeah, th this is also a, an issue in any, really in any disease that's not treatable by right. a traditional or available uh, medical therapy. You see people spring up that are really not physicians, they're more entrepreneurs, right. they're, they're business people, and they're marketing something to make a buck, and it's, also, it's often uh, sort of fly-by-night trend of the moment. Right, right, yeah. And so I think one of the goals of this episode with you is to sort of 
educate people on what stem cells are, what they can do, what they can't do. And then, um, you know, talk about the directions that stem cell uh, treatment and research is headed in. Shall we begin? Okay. All right. So let's start off with what stem cells are. So you've got, um, I think, three different classes. You have totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent. Um, that's how I understand it. Um, can you extrapolate a little bit more on the definition of stem cells? Yeah, it's certainly worth doing that as we start off, Daniel. The stem cell itself is fairly easy to define. It's a cell that can uh, make itself again. When it divides, it makes a replacement. And it can make a cell that can become any other type of cell in the body. Yeah. So that's its stemness. And so that's a pretty narrow definition. So there are a lot of things that are not stem cells and things that we often see in the in the medical literature pop up and mistakenly call themselves stem cells. Um, so adult stem cells are usually not stem cells. They're things like mesenchymal stromal cells or MSCs that we'll see in the literature. And these are cell therapies and we can apply them to a disease, but they're not a stem cell therapy. So stem cells are fairly rigidly defined and by themselves are not used at all because you wouldn't want to put a stem cell in someone's brain, for example, because mm. it would form a tumor. Mm. It's going to form any kind of cell it, can, it wants. Right. And so we, we aren't really even strictly using stem cells as therapy. We're taking them as the starting material to make something else like a neuron or a glial cell. Right, because and they'll, they can potentially form into tumors because they'll keep replicating, right? right? That's their function, to keep replicating and not stop. Right, they'll keep dividing and they'll start to spin off different kinds of uh, tissues. Right, um, so, but then there's also ways that stem cells, or not, I'm sorry, that cells that are already differentiated can revert back to being stem cells, is that right? Yes, and so that gets back to your original statement, what are classifications? And so taking stem cells now with that definition, there are embryonic stem cells, mm -hmm which have been around uh, in, in a well-understood way since the late 90s. And then there are induced pluripotent stem cells, which the Nobel Prize was awarded for, for work that was in 2006. Right. And the two are different. Um, ES cells or embryonic stem cells are from an embryo. <clears throat> when you work, talk about human embryonic stem cells, really from a stage of an embryo called a blastocyst. And that generated a lot of the ethical controversy that really hit the stem cell field early on. Right. An induced pluripotent stem cell can come from a human adult mm -hmm. skin, or now we get them mostly from blood, and you you trick the cell to become an adult cell back into a stem state. Right. And the advantage there is that could theoretically come from anyone, or including the patient themselves. So I would say most stem cell work in the neuroscience field now focuses on that second class, the induced pluripotent stem cell. Now, is there a difference between efficacy, potency between an embryonic stem cell and a induced pluripotent stem cell? In theory, no. They're both pluripotent, as you indicate, meaning they can form any tissue in the body. Right. They are stem cells. In practicality, there are issues with iPS cells mm -hmm. in terms of when you think about a human therapy. So when you're putting them in mouse mo or rat models of disease, um, they are uh, less rigorously handled and right. they're usually uh, easier to work with and, and use in an experiment. Okay. When you think about a human therapy, they have to fit really stringent criteria like a drug. They have to be highly pure. You have to really know the product. And that's where we're starting to find that iPSCs require a little more work. Mm. They may have mutations that occurred as part of that conversion process. They, they may not all be the same. So there's a little more work that has to go into an iPSC, whereas the ESCs, the embryonic stem cells, are usually a line right. or something that's been around in the freezer for a while and they're well understood. Got it. And I've seen fetal stem cells thrown around. Is that the same thing as embryonic or is that another class? They're more like an adult stem cell. Okay. Once you get past this very early blastocyst stage, right. when you're by the time you're, you have a fetus, they're now really committed. Yeah. And so they're like mesenchymal stem stromal cells or hematopoietic progenitors. They're not a stem cell anymore. Right. So let's break that down into those. Uh, I think there's three categories, right? There's mesenchymal stromal cell. There's the hematopoietic stem cell and then neurostem cell. Is that right? That's one way to classify them. 
Um, the neural, in terms of if, if when they exist in the adult, I guess is what you're getting at. Right. Because the adult brain has stem cells in it, and that would be the neural stem cell, yes. Right. And so, so does the bone marrow. There's the hematopoietic stem cell. Mm -hmm. And our muscles and ligaments and tendons have these stromal cells in them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all, they also, also exist in, in bone marrow um, that are... Uh, not a stem cell, but a, pro a progenitor. So that would be a useful way to think about things. Right. So just to break it down, just so that I make sure, you mm -hmm. know, I, I'd like everyone to understand this. It's um, a lot of the muscle cells, tendon cells come from mesenchymal stromal stem cells, right? A lot of our, um, um, you know, blood cells and immune system cells come from the hematopoietic stem cells. And then the, our neurons and all our, all our other cells in our brain, like ast um, astrocytes and, and glial cells come from the neural stem cells. Exactly, so each organ has, in that, in that model, right. a, a progenitor cell, something that's kind of like a stem cell. It can't form every cell in the body, mm -hmm. but it might be able to form every cell in that organ. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about progenitor cells then, because I also see some studies thrown about where they're implanting or infusing uh, progenitor cells. So what's the downside then if you're trying to, in brain injury, right? Implanting a progenitor cell, which would be, you know, like a neural stem cell, right? Um, in the brain, instead of implanting something that is more immature, like uh, like an embryonic stem cell or something more, more immature along that line. Those are very good questions. So we have brain damage, right. an area of damage from a traumatic brain injury or from a stroke. The tissue around it is partially injured but capable of recovery. Mm -hmm. And so the idea has been, let's put in a immature cell that is able to stimulate this mature tissue mm -hmm. into becoming more plastic okay. and repairing itself. That's kind of the idea. Got it. And so people have used uh, immature cells or progenitor cells to do this. Mm -hmm. They came from stem cells and they were uh, pushed a little further down the differentiation road. So then now they're no longer stem, they're more committed, mm -hmm. but they're still, they still could form a diff, they could form many of the other cells in the tissue, right. which in the brain are the glia and neurons. Right. So people transplant the progenitors in the hopes that two things might happen. They could stimulate the injured brain to recover because they're secreting things right. that, um, the, that, that might be like growth factors. The second thing is they could themselves directly differentiate into neurons or glia mm -hmm. and replace damaged circuits. Right. So those are the two goals. Okay. And they use progenitors simply because they're not, it's the next stage away from a stem cell. Right. And so properly speaking, if we were, when people talk about brain stem cell therapy, it's mm -hmm. really progenitor cell therapy. Okay, so that is what is being implanted is actually the progenitor cell, either the for muscle mesenchymal stromal cell, um, for you know uh, blood, it would be a hematopoietic stem cell, or for the uh, the brain progenitor cell would be the neural stem cell. Right. Right. Um, but the reason it's called a stem cell is because um, the the initial sort of um, cultivation process starts with a stem cell, right? For most of those, and it also is kind of the field's term, right? And so you're sort of stuck with it. It's a very Hot and interesting term. Yeah, that's for right. sure. It brings a lot of attention. So people will use it simply because of product identification. Right. I'm sure you don't mind it. Yeah. Well, I think it's easier to capture attention that way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, what about exosomes? So I see a lot about exosomes specifically in the context of uh, mesenchymal stromal cells because I think they produce the exosomes the most or something like that. Do you mind? Talking about exosomes a little bit? Exosomes have a little bit of the same buzz associated with it scientifically as the stem cell field. Mm -hmm. A surprising discovery with even more evolution and, and changing and, and additional surprising discoveries. So the discovery was that most cells put out little vesicles, little pockets of themselves and secrete them. Mm. And they might have a messenger RNA in them or micro RNAs or proteins, and they'll just pump them out. Mm -hmm. And that was surprising. What is a cell pumping parts of its contents out for? Right. So almost all cells produce exosomes. Yeah. 
and you could get them from anything. Now, MSCs or mesenchymal stromal cells are easy to grow. Mm -hmm. um, they come from bone marrow most often, and you can just really grow them easily in the lab. And they were a primary use and target early on of cell therapies. Mm. And so people had them in their lab, and if exosomes are a thing and we've discovered them, why not check to see if MSCs are producing them? And indeed they were. Right. And so then it's very easy to purify them and put them in a model of disease, a lab model of disease and see if they worked. And many of them did. And so, but we're still stuck at the stage of how are they working? Well, we do need to understand the mechanism before we can really go further with it. And what's the consistency if lab X has exosomes from MSCs that they have, are they the same as lab Y? And because it's important to understand you know, what's going on biologically. Right. But um, specifically in the context of brain injury, like why would I want a mesenchymal stromal stem cell in the brain or in the central nervous system? If I mean, I'm sure it has other qualities like it can enhance growth factor. It can um, potentially be anti-inflammatory, but it's not going to differentiate into, you know, a, a brain cell, either a neuron, a glia or an astrocyte, right? Yeah, there's a couple of limitations to the con concepts you've, you've given. So first off, when you give these IV infusions of MSCs or hematopoietic progenitors, there have been clinical trials in which they've done that in head injury and mm -hmm. in stroke, they don't get into the brain. Mm -hmm. So um, that, the idea that if you give it by vein, it's somehow getting into the injured site, they, most of them actually just lodge in the lungs. Okay. Um, but they still can improve recovery in animal models. Right. So something's happening with them. Sure. So that's the first thing. They're not getting into the brain and turning into brain things. Right. They're, they're instead kind of modifying maybe the inflammation in the body. Right. And the idea was these are living cells that mm -hmm. could divide and could, in theory, stick around, yeah. which isn't maybe such a good thing if you have a cell that's from someone else in your body from a cell therapy. Right. So the idea was, well, if they're sticking, say, in the lungs, but improving recovery, maybe they are secreting exosomes, or maybe their, their effect is from their, their secreting profile. Right. So why not just give the thing they're secreting? Okay. And then you don't have a live cell that might still persist in the body. Right, but when you're talking exosomes, you're not... Uh, you're not assuming or or theorizing that potentially the exosomes themselves are differentiating into that appropriate tissue that you're targeting, right? Right. It's more of the anti-inflammatory and any other qualities that would not involve differentiation into the actual tissue you're targeting. Right. They might be considered as a very complex drug or molecule delivery vehicle. You okay. can think of the exome as a packet of all these things, and some of them are enhancing recovery. Got it. Now, let's get into it with the preclinical and clinical evidence for uh, the use of um, stem cells um, for brain injury recovery, right? So I'll start off. So they did a study, uh, Richard Hartman and colleagues um, at Loma Linda in 2020. I'm sure, you know, there's a lot older studies, but this study showed that uh, stem cells improved stroke lesions in rat pups or rat babies uh, that had suffered a stroke. And I wish I could pull it up on this TV, but we don't have the capability today, unfortunately. Um, but they actually showed they dyed the neural stem cell. They injected it onto the other side of the brain. So there was a lesion on this side. They injected it onto the other side into the ventricle. And, you know, they actually saw, they took pictures and they actually saw with the dye, the stem cells migrated to the lesion, right? Surrounded the lesion and then actually um, decreased the size of the lesion at I think one month and then three months. I'll try to bring up the picture um, in the screen, but it was really, really striking. Um, and that was a conclusion that actually stem cells rescued the damaged regions of the brain, but not the already dead region. Um, and then uh, there's another clinical study that you're probably familiar with, the STEMTRA trial. Uh, I believe um, our own UCLA doctor, Stephen Kramer, mm -hmm. was part of that study. They mm -hmm. took uh, 63 patients with uh, long-standing motor deficits after a traumatic brain injury, um, and they underwent bone marrow design, uh, derived mesenchymal stem cells. And um, they actually found that there was significant improvement in the stem cell group versus the control group at 24 weeks uh, in regards to their motor deficits, which mm -hmm. they measured with something called the Fugelmeyer scale score. Um, you know, that, 
they didn't see a significant improvement between the control and the stem cell group, I believe at 48 weeks, but you know, I think nonetheless, that's pretty significant. Yes, and that, so as a conflict of interest statement, I was an advisor to the company for that human clinical trial. Okay. The company's called Sandbio, so yeah. your listeners should know that. Yeah, sure. I don't think it's gonna it's gonna change their mind or it's gonna sway them one way or another. But what do you what do you think about that? And, and it, maybe if you could provide other evidence. Sure, those two are very different examples. Um, most of us, when we think of treating brain injury, it's stroke or head injury, we think of treating adults and not neonates mm -hmm. or first couple of week year right, old right. kids. Mm -hmm. And that's what that first study did, as you noted. There's a couple of things in the developing brain that allow cells to really migrate and integrate into circuits that the adult brain doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so that's one issue is that studies in these in rat pups, as you indicated with that, or other really young uh, experimental models of injury, they don't generalize to adult uh, humans. Right. But they are phenomenal. They yeah. indicate the biology that's available. Sure. Uh, most of the time in adult transplants, the idea is to put the cells in the area of damage and partial recovery, mm -hmm. like in the San Bio trial mm -hmm. th that you mentioned, and see if they can either themselves be part of the new circuit, they can differentiate, or stimulate uh, recovery by modifying things. Right. And so the idea behind that San Bio trial, or the, the, MS the MSCs that have modified a bit, is that they might change inflammation or secrete growth factors, even at the chronic stage, mm -hmm. that can enhance, in that case, con motor control. Right. And they did uh, in the short term. So yeah. that was the first positive trial. Yeah. Um, is there an, any other clinical evidence that's pretty striking to you that you could discuss off the top of your head regarding the use of stem cells in brain injury recovery? There have been several trials that have looked interesting and, 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 pl and been planned or kind of gotten off the the ground and then for a variety of, of more economic reasons been shelved, but mm. we're very close. I think there are gonna be many trials coming that will be pretty exciting here. Yeah. Um, uh, what about the Piscus trial? Pisces. Pisces, yes. oh my God. That's how familiar <laughs> I am with that trial. I can't even pronounce the damn yeah, thing. Yeah, that was one I mentioned that got shelved for financial reasons, yeah. but that was a um, that was a really interesting trial, and w most of us were f felt that was going to be an important trial for what we might call stem cells 1.0. Mm -hmm. So you think of like software development. MSCs are really stem cells 0 0.5. They're not really stem cells. Right. They can't differentiate into much. They they really can only differentiate into ligament or or fib or fibrous fibrous kinds of cells. So they're not really a stem cell therapy, whereas this approach in the Pisces trial was the first that was more uh, linked to traditional stem cell biology, but that got shelved, uh, they ran out of funding. Yeah, so um, just to describe people what this trial was, the Pisces uh, stands for Pilot Investigation of Stem Cells in Stroke, and it is the world's first uh, fully, fully regulated clinical trial of a neural stem cell therapy, right? So that's the point you were trying to make, which it's like, it's a neural stem cell therapy, not a mesenchymal uh, stromal's uh, stem cell therapy, like the STEMTRA trial was, which we just talked about in traumatic brain injury. Um, and they looked at um, disabled stroke patients. And um, there was uh, three different, uh, two different trials, I'm sorry, of Pisces 1, uh, which is just like a safety tolerability, see if like it was even feasible to do. Yes. Uh, which they did find that it was feasible to do. Um, and there was some efficacy associated with that, right? Yes. Where I think there was improvement in um, their overall functionality. I, I forget exactly uh, at what time point they looked at. Um, but another interesting thing that I thought was interesting that they looked at, they looked at fMRI in that study too. Mm -hmm. And they actually found, I think, enhanced, enhanced connectivity in an area of the brain lesion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, they, they did. That's a harder endpoint to understand, but it, um, but it's that, and that's a separate issue in the field. What are markers of increased recovery right. that aren't behavioral that we could, might use? Blood markers or MRI markers? Right. Yeah. And I think another another point that I'm probably going to bring up a little bit later when we talk about the obstacles to to furthering stem cell research would be how do you track the stem cells in the body? Right. How do you make sure, at least in, in a clinical trial, um, that they're going to where they're supposed to go um, and they're doing what they're supposed to do? Right. Yes, and there is no way to do that. There's no way to do that right now, right? Um, and then uh, the Pisces II trial took uh, 23 patients 
injected those neural stem cells into a certain part of the brain called the putamen that really is involved with uh, motor control on the same side that people have suffered the stroke. Um, at, tw at 12 months uh, post-treatment, they noticed, they noticed a response rate of 15%. Um, uh, you know, in something called the ARAT primary endpoint, which is basically you're assessing people's ability to, to grasp and lift their arm. So improvement nonetheless. Um, but you said that the Pisces 3, which was supposed to happen, got shelved due to um, financial issues. That's what I've heard, yeah. We yeah. were a site, um, yeah. and, uh, that, and I heard there were financial issues that led to loss of funding. Yeah, and I think I looked on their website. It was secondary to COVID. COVID really hit them hard, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so let's talk about actually how stem cells are working, right? So we kind of uh, beat around the bush a little bit earlier regarding like how it actually works. But I think that logic states that, you know, you inject a uh, immature cell into a brain injury and via some magic of environment, right? These uh, stem cells then differentiate into the exact kind of cell um, that you need to recover function, right? Do you feel that there might be an element of that, especially when you're talking about the neural stem cell implantation? There is an element of that. So the cells have the capacity to differentiate, say, into neurons mm -hmm. or into glial cells and integrate into the circuits that are injured. Uh, so a, an element of the mechanism may be that. It's not exact. And that's the interesting thing is what's the tolerance of the brain for an injured circuit's repair? Does it have to be exactly like it was before? Or can you learn and use a circuit that's kind of partially and inexactly repaired? Right. And it appears you can use the latter. Yeah. There's evidence from, again, uh, mouse and rat models of disease that if you can recover 10 or 15% of the injured circuits, no matter how you do it, that you can use that as an ability to relearn and and uh, recover. Got it. So you may you, that's all you may need out of a stem cell therapy. Yeah. Uh, and a, a possibility is we also know that are, there are brain circuits that were next to the stroke or in next to the head injury and are stunned. They just don't really come back online. Mm -hmm. And so you may bring those back online with a, with a cell therapy. Yeah. Or, um, uh, and, and that may enhance recovery. Yeah. And the third element is, a lot of injury, particularly in traumatic brain injury and also in stroke, is not to the brain neurons that send the signals themselves, but to their uh, connections. Right. And so the brain is massively interconnected. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that carries these dense connections is called the white matter, because when the ancient anatomist used to cut the brain, it looked white because mm -hmm. it, has, it has so much of its insulating material. You know right, this, right. the myelin. Right. And so that gets injured, just this white matter, or these connecting areas, and repairing that is different than repairing the injury to the neuron or the brain cell. And so you may be able to re-insulate and re ensheath injured axons as a third way of recovering. Right. Because um, you're not, all, because different injuries, not every injury damages or not, in, not every injury significantly injures the neurons themselves, but there's other components in the brain that get injured, right? Um, like uh, in multiple sclerosis, for example, right? That targets, like you mentioned, the myelin around, around the neuron, not necessarily the neuron itself, right? Yeah. Um, so you're not necessarily you wouldn't necessarily want to regrow neurons because that's not what's needed in that patholo pathological context, right? You need the myelin around the neuron, and the myelin is important because it, in, like you said, it insulates that transmission that the neuron's sending, right? If that goes away, you can't send that transmission through the uh, through the neuron. So obviously, different different pathological contexts, different things that are needed. Um, so so how does actually the differentiation take place, right? Like, so you you inject the neural stem cell, how would that differenti differentiation actually take place? Is it an environmental thing? Is it something that we can actually control saying, okay, you have MS, um, you need, um, you know, myelin. So, you know, genetically or however it is that you know, you would direct that stem cell to differentiate into a myelin cell. Or is it just, you're just hoping the environment dictates that demand? That's an excellent question. There's a lot of biology but it, in, that, in the answer, but that's a question that's been in, uh, like front and center in the field. And so it turns out the more immature 
a cell is. So you have a stem cell and you can make it a neuron or you can make it a glial cell. And the more immature it is on that pathway, the better it survives the transplant. Okay. And so that's a problem. Many die when you try to transplant them. So the advantage of starting immature is you'll get more cells alive in, in the brain mm-hmm. to repair it. A problem is they don't necessarily follow the right differentiation pathway. And in fact, they may just get stuck at this really immature stage and just sit there as an immature neuron, really not do much, or an immature glial cell. So that's been a big problem. The further you differentiate them, the closer you get to the thing you want, uh, maybe a myelinating cell, Mm -hmm. an uh, an insulating cell, but the more uh, unstable they are, the more likely they are to die. And so it's been this trade-off um, and uh, w- the stem cell field has advanced so that we're now able to differentiate better mm-hmm. and more precisely into the cells we want. And we're now possibly able to transplant them and have them survive better. Yeah. So, and it, that's an interesting balance, right? You don't want to make them too immature because then you're predisposed to p- potentially developing a tumor. That could happen right? too. Uh, but then at the same time, you don't want to differentiate it because you also want them to survive. Right. It's an interesting balance. So what are some um, survivability tactics for implanting stem cells um, that you've noticed? I've seen genetic manipulation and also um, implanting stem cells with like certain gels, like hydrogels or something like that. Is there anything more than that? Yeah, there are a number of strategies there. One is to uh, condition the cells in some way so that they have a greater survivability. And some have been, believe it or not, exposing them to low oxygen. Hmm. which kind of shocks them and activates some molecular systems that allows them to survive better. Are you referring to heat shock proteins? Or yes. No? You yeah. are? Yeah, so some I saw of, that. I was like, yeah. am I going to bring that up? Am I not? I don't know. That's interesting. Some, some have done that. So you sort of shock them and then transplant them. Okay. That hasn't gotten, That's that has been in the scientific literature. It hasn't gotten very far. Okay. Um, other strategies are to use bioengineering, as you indicate. Right. So you might be able to put them in a matrix that's pro-growth and pro-survival. Yeah. The problem is that's a volume. It's a, it's a matrix. It's a biopolymer in some cases, and we've done some of this work. It works in stroke because in stroke you have an area of dense damage that's absorbed, mm-hmm. so you actually have a cavity, right. and you could fill it with your biomaterial stem cell conjugate. Right. But in in most TBI or traumatic brain injury, you don't have a cavity except right. in so, so you don't want to inject something that's going to expand yeah. if there's normal brain there. Jesus. And so that's been a limit to the biomaterials part. In spinal cord injury, biomaterials have been really important because you have also a gap or a cavity and you might actually help by bridging that. Yeah. So again, bioengineering has been a main focus in spinal cord injury and stroke, yeah. but not in other conditions as much. Yeah. Let's go down a rabbit hole. What about spinal cord injury? What about, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if, if you're familiar, it sounds like you are, um, the, uh, the clinical evidence regarding um, stem cell therapy for spinal cord injury. From what I saw, it's not very good regarding the, like, the, more, the more recent stuff that's been done. A lot of it's implanting mesenchymal stromal cells, which again, doesn't really make sense to me if you're trying to you know, regrow certain projections and certain uh, neurons. What do you think about that? I agree that the if you're giving them intravenously, they're not even getting to the spinal cord. Right, because there's it, still a there's a blood spine barrier, which is the same kind of the same thing as a blood brain barrier, but for the spine. Sorry to interrupt. Right, no, yeah. that's a good clarifying point. And so they're doing something. If they're having an effect, it's doing something to the whole body right. that the spinal cord also find the injured spinal spinal cord finds beneficial. Maybe there there's inflammation in the body, and they're modifying that. Right. But directly injecting MSCs or mesenchymal stromal cells into the spinal cord is probably not a translatable approach because they won't do anything themselves. Right, right. Yeah, but has any, has, have they done neural stem cell implantation in spinal cord injury? They have in many models, yeah. often with a, a hydrogel or, a, or a, a series of biological polymers that gel. Yeah. And that's moved along pretty well. Okay. There are several labs that have done that with ver- varieties, with very different kinds of true stem cell derived immature neurons mm. and have shown recovery, including in primates. Right. And so there's, which is a higher model, larger spinal cord closer to a human. Right, right. So that looks promising. Yeah, excellent. What about, how do you, so we talked about, you can't assess whether 
Okay, so right now, pre preclinically in animal models, you can you can look at you know implanted stem cells in the brain or wherever, and you can actually assess their function, right? So I think um, a group at Stanford did that in 2009. I think it's Dottie and and colleagues at Stanford actually looked at embryonic stem cell implantation of the mouse models of stroke. And they found the stem cells migrated to the lesion. They differentiated into the different types of neurons. And then um, they had like neurophysiologic evidence of synaptic connections, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that was translated to improved motor function in the mice, right? So that neurophysiologic evidence that actually these stem cells are connecting, they are communicating, they are integrating into the actual brain connectivity in the brain system. We can't assess that in humans right, right now, right? Yes. Unless optogenetics makes uh, some advances. Well, yeah, unless we find some way to label the cells right. that we could track on MRI or some other imaging right. uh, modality. So do you want to explain what optogenetics is? There's a variety of things that fall under that. Okay. Um, I suppose we might just uh, define it at a kind of a high level. Okay. And that is putting a gene into a cell that allows it to be seen optically right. or to be stimulated optically. Okay. And so the kinds of things that, it, that, that have been done is you could put a gene into a brain cell in which if you shine light on it, the brain cell will fire a signal. Right. Or you could put a gene into a brain cell that when, uh, when you do something to it, it, it lights up and you can see it. Mm. There's real hope that if you did that with a stem cell therapy, you could turn the stem cell therapy on mm -hmm. with light or you could see it. Right now, we can't track cells that are put in the human brain. Right. So uh, let's um, let's draw that out a little bit. So you you adjust the gene of the stem cell, you implant it, right? You adjust the gene so that it reacts to that light and it activates when you shine that light at it, right? You implant it into the brain, you shine the light at it, and then if it fires, then it's integrated into the in, into the system. I'm sure it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? The idea, though, is. Um, kind of an old adage that brain cells that fire together wire together. Okay. And so the we've long been known that the more active a cell is in general, the more likely it is to integrate into a circuit. Got it. And so that's what you're alluding to, is that if you could somehow stimulate these cells that you transplanted, they're more likely to integrate into the injured brain. Yeah. And let's go back to survivability. What's sort of the greatest length of time that we've noticed that a stem cell can survive in... Um, you know, a brain? Well, that's a great question. There's a couple of ways to answer that. One is in rodent models, they can survive in the right conditions for the life of the rodent, mm -hmm. which is usually around two years. Right. Um, in humans, there have been fetal transplants that were really ongoing for Parkinson's disease. And in one or two cases, the brains have come to autopsy years later, and th the cells have been found in the brain. Right. And so it's likely that in a variety of environments, cells can survive for a long time when directly transplanted into the brain. Mm. And then let's talk about, so what about fMRI for, to assess the functionality after uh, neural stem cell or stem cell implantation? Is there you know, any potential for that? There is potential. It's a problematic field. And so it really took off in the, in the 1990s, early 2000s. You could use functional MRI to fire, to understand what parts of the brain are firing and what, and how that might mediate a circuit. Right. So if areas five through 12 of the brain are firing together all the time when the person reaches for a cup, maybe that's the cup circuit. Yeah. And if somebody has a stroke and the cup circuit is inactive, you could then see if the cup circuit comes back and if a stem cell therapy brings it back. Right. It seemed very promising. The problem is it turns out to be hugely variable. Mm. So not the same circuits, even for the same movement, are found in different centers doing the same fMRI studies. Right, right. So it's very variable by investigator, mm -hmm. by whether UCLA or Yale or Harvard are doing this scanning. And so it hasn't, we can't standardize it as well right. and say, we gave you a stem cell therapy, we see this new fMRI pattern and therefore it's a marker of recovery. We right. We're not there yet. We're not there yet, yeah. Um, what about this migration of the stem cells to the actual injury site? I mean, that's pretty striking, right? And I'm sure there's, I mean, they're attracted by inflammation or they're attracted by some sort of, you know, factors that are released at the injury site, right? But um, 
I found that pretty striking, especially some of the preclinical models that we looked at. Yeah, that is promising. So there's a lot of brain that's not injured. Right. And you don't want to have cells go off into these other areas that right. are theoretically okay. And yeah. it's been striking to see these cells recognize and migrate to areas of injury, likely due to inf inflammatory signals, possibly due to changes in blood vessel growth that they recognize. Yeah. Mind of their own. Yeah, clearly they home into injured areas. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, that's, um, that's very um, promising for traumatic brain injury, I think, especially like you mentioned in TBI, you don't have like a cavity that forms like a stroke, right? Like you have, that's where you lost blood flow, that part of the brain dies, right? Traumatic brain injury, especially mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, it's more of a functional, right? Especially with some of the higher, um, higher tech imaging modalities, right? There might be some shearing injury, you know, at a certain part of the brain. And, you know, would stem cells work for that? You know, initially I would say, you know, probably not because you don't know where to implant them. But, you know, if there's a, enough evidence showing that these things will migrate wherever there's brain injury, right, and do their thing, whether that's regeneration, integration, or, you know, that anti-inflammatory component releasing growth factors in that area to promote um, regrowth, you know, I think that's, that's a, a pretty good case for that. Yeah, there's, there's hope that if you had a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury yeah. and you put the cells next to the area of most severe injury, that they mm -hmm. might migrate a little more diffusely to areas that are stretched and yeah. bruised and, yeah. and help repair those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what about those stem cells? I've seen that the, the stem cells that are implanted could then enhance the migration of other stem cells throughout the brain to that area too. Yeah, that's been really dramatic in, in mouse and rat models of disease, yeah. like stroke and TBI. One, one caveat, one limit there is that the human stem cell system in the brain is very different than the rodent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, rats and mice have this really advanced brain stem cell system that seems to be there for the life of the animal. Mm -hmm. And humans are missing the largest brain, adult, adult people are missing the largest stem cell area that rodents seem to have, the so-called subventricular zone. Yeah. It's not prominent at all and may not exist in adults. Mm. And so the idea of stimulating for most of the brain endogenous or naturally present stem cells for recovery is not as likely, is not as promising in humans as it is in rodents. Got it. Now, what about neuroplasticity? So another fancy, very attractive term, right? This term about neuroplasticity, we hear about a lot, things that can enhance neuroplasticity, different stuff like that. Um, neural stem cells, they, I've seen that they can actually enhance neuroplasticity, right? Um, separate from them actually just integrating themselves, but somehow they can actually enhance that function, which is critical in brain injury recovery, right? Yes, yeah, so yeah. They, may, they might, if you have a circuit that is normally firing in precise sequence, to use the cup analogy, to reach, reach and grasp a cup, all these cells signal together to coordinate all the shoulder, arm, wrist movements, and all of a sudden after a stroke, maybe it was nearby, but it shouldn't have damaged this exact circuit, but they're not firing together anymore. Right, right. And so that's one idea behind neuroplasticity is how can we bring them back online mm -hmm. so they can fire together to, to make a poem right. or you know, reach and grab a cup. Right. And a big part of that enhancement of neuroplasticity is the trophic factors that are potentially released by the stem cells, right? BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and I think uh, VEGF, V-E-G-F, right? Those are two prominent two growth prominent factors, yeah. yes. Yeah, and those can enhance neuroplasticity. They, yeah, they can cause neurons to grow new connections. Mm. And then uh, the, the VEGF uh, trophic factor can also enhance blood vessel, blood vessel growth to that area, which is obviously a requirement in uh, um, stabilizing an environment for um, either enhanced plasticity or further neuronal and external growth, right? Right, and maybe that these transplanted cells are releasing those factors in others. Right. Excellent. Um, so why don't we step back and talk about what the process of like a stem cell in implantation looks like? Like someone comes in with a brain injury, right? Um, do you have like a reservoir? You, you pull the stem cells out of the refrigerator? 
right? Or is it more you harvest the stem cells from them and then you give it back to them? What, what does that look like, Jen? Or what would it look like? Yeah, what you've, yeah. What you've brought up is a yawning gap in the field yeah. because this is the part of late stage translation that has not really been uh, uh, attended to in most of the studies. Yeah. So particularly in the popular press, the studies are mouse with a spinal cord lesion, rat with a stroke, put cells in, they get better, we're, we're there. Right. You know, human therapy two years down the road. Right. But the problem is there are a number of really daunting problems, and one is scale up. You've gotta have trillions of cells to go into a human therapy, and they have to be exactly the same, just like a drug. Yeah. And they have to be pure, you have to know they're potent, and that they're all gonna be the same. So scaling up is a big problem. Okay. Delivery is the second problem. How do you deliver in humans in an absolutely sterile and controlled environment? You, it's not the same as injecting into a mouse brain. Right. What's the delivery system? What's the stability of the cells? Right. Are they in the freezer right. near the OR and you just kind of walk them over? Do you have to thaw them in the OR? That's right. kind of an, an odd step and right. go, and get them kind of going. What are, you know? This, so that's a second thing. And then the third thing you brought up is kind of interesting. It is a holy grail that you read about, autologous therapy. So maybe with the IPS therapy we were talking about, you could take the patient's own skin cell, turn it into their own neuron, and if they have stroke or Parkinson's disease or head injury, give them their own cell, and then you don't have to suppress his the immune system's attack on non-self. Right, right. And so that would be great. And the, it's technically very complex, it's very expensive. And then one question is, what's the quality of the cell you develop? Yeah, because that's gonna vary from one site to the next, right? Maybe, Depending on their technique, on, unless you right. standardize a technique, but that's probably years down the line. And we're learning that the, I, the, 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 the thing that won the Nobel Prize, to take a skin cell and trick it into a stem cell and then turn that into a brain cell, introduces mutations that were unexpected and we're still just learning about. Right. Even several weeks ago, an important paper came out that suggests we may have mutations throughout the genome in some of these cells. Let me, my, uh, my mind's gonna run a little bit. So let's say we're implanting stem cells with mutations into, um, into the brains of people with um, brain injuries, but they have mutations in it, but they integrate into the brain. What would, what, what would that even look like? That's a sci-fi, uh, that might be a sci-fi, uh, sci-fi movie. It's a huge problem because most mutations are harmless. So right. if we just do, if we detect mutations in, in genes that aren't pathogenic, then we shouldn't be worrying about them. And so right. Part of it is an, uh, uh, an informatics problem. We have yeah. to understand where the mutations are and what they're likely to be in terms of, of pr disease producing. Sure, yeah. Um, what about the timing of the transplantation in relation to the injury? So we, I mean, generally I think maybe we think about, um, you know, someone with a chronic injury, right? Meaning they had the injury a year ago or something, right? And they're just not getting better. Let's try and implant stem cells to see if we can, you know, promote neuronal growth and decrease inflammation. Um, but there's also other propositions to do it like right after the injury, right? What do you think about that? Is there, is there a time period where it's most efficacious to receive stem cells for brain injury? Yeah, the arguments are this. So right after the stroke and in the first three to six months, and we also see this in head injury, most recovery occurs. So the brain is rapidly reorganizing and right. very plastic. And so if we could put something in then that further enhances this rapid natural plasticity, maybe we can bring it to a higher level. Right. The second argument though is, we don't know how good somebody's gonna get and what happens if we interfere with natural recovery? Uh, that's interesting. So at chronic right. phases, they're plateaued. Right. We know they're sort of stuck. Right. Right. So we might further boost the system. Sure. The problem with that though is there aren't these natural things ongoing that we can enhance. We kind of have to start the engine cold. Right. And that takes more work. And, uh, and, and I can get into what that might take, but it probably takes a more florid therapy, like a stem cell as opposed to a drug mm -hmm. in, in the chronic condition, and then a lot of neuro rehab that you have to fold into these. Right, um, yeah, because, I mean, neuroplasticity is certainly a good thing, but it involves um, excitability. G generally, it involves excitability of the brain, right? And we know that excitability, in the, at least in the context of traumatic brain injury, could be also pathological, right? Excitotoxicity, right? Where the brain becomes very, very excitable, especially right after the injury. 
um, and actually potentially worsens either lesions or outcomes, different things like that, right? Right. There is a theoretical risk of too much activity, especially early on after the injury, exacerbating the lesion. Mm -hmm. So there's some sort of window where you would not want a plasticity therapy or a stem cell therapy to go into the brain. Right. It's probably something like the first week yeah. after the injury. Yeah, got it. Let's talk about some other adverse effects of stem cells. Um, autoimmune reactions, right? Anytime you're implanting something foreign or exogenous um, into the brain or into the body, you're always worried about um, the patients or, their, or whoever's immune system actually attacking that thing, right? And uh, maybe you can mitigate that by it being y you um, harvesting and creating the stem cell from either skin or something like that. But, you know, nonetheless, it seems like people receiving stem cells would probably have to be on immunosuppressants. Is that right? That's right. Most of the clinical trials now have a transient immunosuppressive period, mm -hmm. um, usually around uh, a month or six weeks, okay. which they suppress the immune system. The brain is partially immune privileged. It's not like the liver or somewhere, some peripheral organ, which is constantly suffused with circulating stem cells, mm -hmm. but it's not fully privileged. And so the idea is maybe if we suppress the immune system for a short period and then gradually release that suppression, the cells will be privileged and okay. Right, okay. It's never been proven, so yeah. we'll have to find out in a, in a solid trial. Yeah, is it, is it pretty certain that someone not, immune, uh, not, sorry, not receiving immunosuppressants um, will have an autoimmune reaction to? It's not certain. It's not so certain. So the Pisces trial we talked about before did not use immunosuppression. Right. And, the, and so the idea is still somewhat debatable whether in the brain you need it for a stem cell therapy. Right, yeah, it's interesting. Um, because a lot of other potential adverse effects come along with immunosuppression, right? They really do. Of course, we know the adverse effects of long-term immunosuppression, secondary cancers and, and, uh, and, and opportunistic infections. Short-term therapy is more like fractures, weight gain, right. hypertension, things like that. Yeah. Um, something that's always looked out for or monitored in a lot of the clinical trials um, and even preclinical pre trials is um, these stem cells turning into tumors. Um, where we are now with stem cell implantation and the kind of stem cells that we're implanting, how um, re like realistic is that scenario? Mostly it's, we've evolved past that. Okay. So we're now tr deliberately trying to push the cells to become a little more committed, a little more differentiated. Right. So they're less proliferative. Right. We're trying to get them into a specific cell type. Mm -hmm. That's really, if we use the product uh, uh, line again, that's really stem cells 2.0. Right. So 1.0 is to try to get just immature neurons or immature glial cells in yeah. and see if they could, because they're immature, could right. respond and, 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 and repair the brain. The next gen is really stem cells 2.0, and that's to push them even further to a, a designer therapy, okay. specifically designed to replace or repair a, a, an identifiable circuit. Right, but the issue with that is um, survivability, right? Which we right. talked about before. These things don't survive that well, the more differentiated they are. Right. Yeah. What do you think the leading um, method to increase survivability is right now for uh, progenitor cells or more differentiated stem cells? There's been a lot of advances just in mundane things like how you freeze them and how you thaw them mm. and the media with which you grow them and inject them. The needles themselves, the injectable uh, uh, hardware have improved. So we've improved all along in this less glamorous area of the stem cell field yeah. and enhanced survivability that way. Yeah, great. Um, so, what, I'm, what are some additional challenges that you see for stem cell therapy? Um, let's start with, and we already mentioned it, and we could just like rehash it again, um, actually tracking the stem cells in humans after we, after we implant them. Not we, I'm not implanting anything. I'm not mm -hmm. involved with any of this stuff, just you are. But, <laughs> um, but I'm very interested. So I am going to include myself. Um, no, uh, how, do you, how, how are we tracking them? At yeah, we're point. not. Yeah. We have no idea where they are, where they go. So we inject them and we say, do you improve or not? Yeah. Via just like motor function and right. assessment. It's behavioral. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there's been a lot of work on this and it's still ongoing. And some of it will probably at some point yield a positive result, but you might, inf you might uh, uh, infuse into them particles that you can, rel you can see on MRI. That light up, yeah. The problem is that they may make the cells sick. Often they're iron particles or things like that. Mm. You could put a gene in there 
in, into the transplanted cells that tr makes a protein that you can see in MRI. Mm -hmm. That's also hard, and then that protein keeps getting produced. It's not naturally part of the cell, and right. it, may, it also may be toxic. Right. So we're sort of stuck. Yeah, really complicated. You're trying to develop a stem cell that isn't going to cause a tumor, that is going to survive, and then also it's so delicate, but you're also trying to implant stuff so that you can track it. It just seems like you know, such a dynamic sort of uncertain process. It right really now, is, right? yeah. It's really complicated. It's not as straightforward as some people think maybe. Um, what about the timing logistics? So I looked at, I was, I was looking up some stuff and so let's say someone comes in, right? They have a brain injury, you wanna implant stem cells into them and you wanna do it, you wanna take their cells, you wanna do it, whatever process it is that you're gonna do, create stem cells out of that and then implant it back, right? So the actual process of taking their cells and turning them into stem cells, how long does that actually take? Especially if you're saying, you know, after, you know, after a certain amount of hours I want to implant it or after a certain amount of days I want to implant it? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a real limitation of this autologous stem cell therapy, right. making the patient's own stem cells. It's probably a month to a month and a half at the earliest. To, to take it take it from that patient's cells that are already differentiated and turn them yeah. into their stem cells. Yeah, maybe month. three months. Because you have to take them and turn them into stem cells and then turn them progressively with each step right, towards back. the cell you want. Right, yeah. That seems like a huge barrier. It huge is, barrier. because all of a sudden you're three months down the road. Right, yeah, right, yeah exactly. It's not a, as big a deal in a disease, say, like Parkinson's disease. Right, right, in a neurodegenerative condition yeah. that you have a lot of time for, yeah. Um, yeah, what about, um, you talked about the blood-brain barrier for mesenchymal stromal cells, which aren't neural stem cells. Um, is there is there still an issue regarding getting those neural stem cells or stem cells in general across the blood-brain barrier? Yes, peripherally administered cells of any type appear not to get into the brain. Yeah. So yeah. So they're mod if they're having an effect, and some are that's been replicated in many studies. They're probably modifying something that the whole body is experiencing as a result of the head injury or the stroke, mm. like maybe an inf inflammatory state. Right. What about, what do you think about the argument that, well, there is blood brain barrier dysfunction after brain injury, like a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, and potentially something administered via IV could get through that leaky blood brain barrier and get to that injury site? It could, it's just never been demonstrated. It's never been proven. Yeah, so it's theoretically possible. Right. The blood-brain mirror is a little more open for a period of time, right. but it still hasn't been seen even in experimental animals. Okay, so right now the only way to get it to that site is to just implant it directly there or you know, maybe somewhere in the brain where it would be past the blood-brain barrier where it would be able to get eventually migrate to the lesion site. That's true. There's yes. no delivery mechanism, like any sort of delivery mechanism that you can encode the stem cell in that might be able to help it get through the blood brain barrier, either like maybe by attaching to a receptor that would attach to a receptor on the blood brain barrier that would then sort of bring it into the brain? There is theoretically that second possibility and it's pretty interesting. So you could, as we know for say a stroke, they have super selective catheters that they can go into the brain and pull these micro clots out. Right. You could pull the clot out and then squirt cells into the damaged area. Wow. Right now, that doesn't seem to help. They still seem to just kind of rush along that river of blood and okay. flow back to the rest of the body. So they've done this, actually. They have, yeah. Oh, wow. Not in humans. Okay. But in, but in experimental animals, you could make a gene modification so that the cells that you're putting in there mm -hmm. recognize and, and cross the blood-brain barrier. And people have tried that, and that's possible. Yeah. But we don't know yet if that's going to work. Yeah, yeah. Theoretical. I love theoretics. Um, all right, so I think we talked about a lot of stem cells. Um, where do you see the direct, what's the future direction of research investigating stem cells for brain injury? I think uh, there's probably two pathways. One is to further tune the cells that you're putting in mm -hmm. to really understand what's maximally beneficial to enhance the injured circuits in the brain. Mm -hmm. And the second is to focus uh, much more strongly on the later stage of the clinical uh, translational process. Mm -hmm. How do you scale them up? What does it look like with GMP or good manufacturing principles? Mm -hmm. um, how do you get 
the cells into the proper clinical delivery environment. That hasn't been considered because it's not very glamorous. Right. You don't get a paper in Nature saying uh, this is how this is how we freeze the cells and thaw them in an OR. Right, right. But I think we have to really nail that part of it down. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, what about? Let me. I'm going to put you in a hypothetical situation. Um, let's say you, a family member or a friend, suffers a brain injury, right? And basically, you're in the similar situation that I talked about at the beginning of our episode, right? Um, a, would you seek stem cell therapy as a potential therapy for the condition? I would not, just because I know the data is not there, and I know there are real possibilities of side effects. Right. And so, if, if it was just do no harm, mm -hmm. uh, or they or the cells themselves did no harm, right. and there was a remote possibility of good, you could think about it. But there is no remote possibility of good, and there's a real sense of harm here. And then, of course, there is, as your patient, there's 15K. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, there's 15, yeah they're dollars. expensive. And I've had yeah. patients that, that have paid out of pocket five to 10 to 15K. So right. it's expensive. There's no evidence that it helps, and there's a real possibility of harm. So I would not do a stem cell therapy, even on a loved one who is not recovering well. Right. Do you ever see a, uh, do, do you see a future where stem cells will be um, some sort of standard of care in, uh, you know, in a clinical environment? Yeah, there are enough, there's enough positive preclinical literature in the lab. Mm -hmm. There are enough labs pushing it further down the field. CIRM, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, mm -hmm. has been a big proponent of moving these therapies to the clinic. Yeah. And so there's enough money behind it with good science that we will see this emerge into clinical trials and at least understand, can this be a clinical option? All right, yeah, excellent. Is there anything else? Regarding stem cells. I think we've been exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Can't think of another element to add. Wonderful. That means that we did a good job. Yes. We're trying to get exhaustive on this podcast here. Um, so let's shift now to as if things couldn't be equally, if not more interesting than your research in stem cells. You're also doing research in um, targeting a specific uh uh, molecular target called CCR5, right? And you're looking at it specifically in the context of obviously brain injury and brain injury recovery. Um, and let's just say um, the results are, are pretty significant and pretty striking. And I think that, you know, I know that there's a clinical trial going on, but you know, it, it, it might be pretty revolutionary what you guys end up finding out, right? Yeah, this was surprising work that came across from an initial series of understandings uh, that, I, that, mo that many of us had as just rehab physicians. Right. That when you watch a patient with stroke in their period of, in which they recover spontaneously, they look a lot like they're learning to recover. In other words, the principles of motor learning that we would apply to somebody perfecting a golf swing mm -hmm. or somebody who's doing a, a complicated uh, new task, those principles of normal learning seem to be spontaneously reactivated in recovery after stroke. Mm -hmm. So we wondered, well, the, the, uh, the scientific field of learning has moved much further than, it ha than the stroke field in nailing down the molecules right. that mediate learning. Mm. Could we take some of that and apply it to stroke? Mm -hmm. The molecular mecha mechanisms of memory, could we take some of the biology that we understand there and say, is it also active in recovery and stroke? And so we and others have done that in several different kind of forays. And one of them is in collaboration with a really talented and um, highly recognized memory scientist called Dr. Alcino Silva mm -hmm. and his work initially identified CCR5, and we were collaborating at the time, that this receptor had a role in blocking normal memory formation. Mm -hmm. And so we tested it for blocking that same receptor and enhancing recovery and stroke. Um, I always wonder about these different targets. Like um, evolutionarily, what's the function of CCR5, uh, of the CCR5 receptor? If it blocks memory formation, what kind of evolutionary advantage would it have provided us? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have, if you think about my journey to this sounds, to this stage. So I, I went out of my building, I walked down the street, I came up the hill, 
I got into the lobby. I called you. Mm-hmm. You said, come to the fourth floor. And I came in. A lot of discrete epics. Right. And so I have memories for each one. And they're all discrete. Yeah. Um, and so you need to have an ability to link things together to form a memory. Okay. And then you need to stop that linking. Yeah. Like if my memory was confused of me calling you from the lobby with me walking down the street and they were fused in some weird way, right. I'd have a really disordered life. Got it. And so you need to stop memory formation and linking together of sensory stimuli just as much as you need to have them linked. Got it. And another thing in, that happens with memory is memories are formed when neurons get all excited and, and link together. Mm-hmm. And so brain excitability is key to memory. Yeah. If you generally elevate how excited neurons are and then give them a sensory input, mm-hmm. they're going to store that even better. Right. And so the problem in early after stroke is you don't want too much excitability around because that same excitability of a neuron's near a stroke can kill it. Mm, Neurons are more sensitive to excitability. And you mentioned this before as a term, excitotoxicity. So CCR5 has an added function in stroke. In addition to stopping memory linkage, the brain turns it on massively so that cells aren't too excited after a stroke. Okay. And it limits the progression of damage. Okay. The problem is this system persists and limits recovery. Right. So... What happens when you block CCR5? It's, you really enhance stroke recovery. Okay. So if you allow the brain to get past that injury s- s- period where it's more susceptible to injury, and then you block CCR5, in mouse models of stroke, they get substantially better recovery. What time period is that where you don't want to give CCR5 because you might worsen the injury, but then you want to promote recovery? It's probably three to five days after stroke, you don't want to, to, to deliver a drug like a CCR5 blocker. Okay. And then you can, and then you can enhance recovery because the brain is no longer susceptibility to that unstable injury. So let's talk about what recovery is, what, what you found and, and what recovery means from like just a histological perspective, which means looking at the actual um, neurons, dendrites, different stuff like that. Um, from my understanding... Um, you noted at bilateral, which means both sides, axonal projection sprouting, which means the axons were actually growing and branching off. And then the, um, the spines of dendrites, which is just another component of the brain cells, um, weren't dying off. They were actually sustained. Um, is there anything else that you thought was significant? Those are the two main cellular mechanisms that we found, that, cells, that brain cells form new connections and that normally their, their inputs, uh, the kind of elaborate telephone inputs they have, the dendrites would prune, mm-hmm. would self-prune. They shouldn't. They, mm-hmm. would, they, would, we would, they would lose connections, and we blocked that loss with CCR5. Right. Tell me about, so there's an injury on one side of the brain, but then you're seeing um, growing of axons on the other side of the brain and on that side of the brain with the lesion. Are they connecting or you just, it's just something that you notice that both of them are, you know, growing and, and, and having neuroplastic functions? Yeah, what we noticed was that the motor planning areas were more tightly interconnected okay. with this drug. Okay. And those two signal to each other on either side. Mm-hmm. And so when you plan a movement, um, you need both sides to communicate to each other in the planning stage. Right. So much so that if one side in a, in, a, in a, say, a mouse, if you use optogenetics, as you indicated, if you turn down one hemisphere of this planning area, the other one can compensate. Mm. And so we think possibly what's happening with this drug is we're interconnecting the two areas more tightly Mm -hmm. so that if one isn't doing so well after the stroke, the other fellow on the other side can kick in. Got it. But that's just a a hypothesis. Yeah. Have you noticed any other brain regions that, that, um, have pronounced activity, uh, neuroplastic function with this medication? Like I would think the hippocampus maybe. We haven't really looked there. Okay. Um, it, the CCR5 antagonists are very active in those normal learning and memory studies mm-hmm. in hippocampus, but we haven't looked there in stroke. Okay, got it. Um, now, there's anti-inflammatory capability of the CCR5 blockade too, right? There is. We didn't find that to be a major role mm. in the stroke recovery effect, though. Got it. Um, but because CCR5 are located on microglia, which are the inflammatory cells in the brain. 
Yes. Right. But I don't think they were significant because the receptor on microglia on those inflammatory cells actually down regulates and isn't really that pronounced. I think 12 hours after the actual injury itself versus the CCR5 receptors on the neurons and on the other brain cells are present, you know, weeks after, right? Right. So the neurons massively turn this on. Right. It's essentially not on in a neuron. And stroke causes them to massively turn it on. Right. And it causes the, the inflammatory cells of the brain, the microglia, to downregulate it and turn it down a little bit. Right. And then what behavioral improvements did you see in these mice after you blocked their CCR5? So the main thing we're looking for in a mouse model is something that's relevant to a human. Right. Because we want to eventually get to human stroke and right. recovery. And so what we measure in a mouse is how they use and control their, fore, their forelimb mm -hmm. and how they walk. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that in both forelimb motor control and walking, the mice get better. Mm. And they get better in a, in a percentage or an amount that's, that is substantial enough that if humans did that same level of improvement, it would be meaningful. And so that's kind of the other thing we look at. Not only is the mouse better, but is there some measure of how much better that we could apply to Translate a human? To humans, yeah. And then you also saw improvements in traumatic brain injury. I always got to bring it up, bring it back to yes. traumatic brain yes. injury, you know. Uh, but you also saw improvements, I think, in cognition in mice that had sustained traumatic brain injury that. Um, received this drug that inactivated CCR5. Yes, this is our collaborator, Esther, Sh Esther Shuhami, Dr. Oh, Shuhami. Yeah, of course, in uh, Israel, out of Jerusalem, right? Yeah, yeah. yes, and she did. she's a ex very experienced traumatic brain injury uh, investigator, and so she also studied this. She was part of our collaborative group cool. in this foundation, and she studied it in TBI, and it improved cognitive recovery. Mm. And it was it the same sort of um, clinically, uh, clinically meaningful amount like you saw in the motor and stroke? Yeah, it, it appeared to be. It's in the um, cognitive aspects, this this level that I alluded to, which is called mi mini minimal clinically important difference right. or MCID. Right, right. What's the minimal difference that's important for a human? Right. That hasn't been as established as much. It is for motor function, right. but it hasn't been established as much for memory, yeah. and particularly memory and TBI. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so what's the... Uh, uh, when you're giving this drug, how long do you have to give it for? Like, is it just a one-time dose? Do you have to give it every day for five days, for example? Like, what, what does that look like? Well, we don't know that yet, so right. we'll really have to test that. We gave it every day for, a, for about a month in mice. Right. And so what we would need to do in, uh, I mean, excuse me, for up to, up to three months in mice. You gave it every day for three months? Yeah. Okay. What we would need to do for... Um, humans is really test that out. Now the clinical trial that we've done that we have ongoing in Canada is to give it every day, give it twice a day because that's the normal human dose for this. Okay. And then but for how long? Um, I'm, I knew you were going to ask that and I was struggling with it. I think it's 60 days. Okay. Yeah. All right. You'll get back to me. Here yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, a lot of times, and I was telling you this before the recording, a lot of times you see things like interventions, like different drug interventions that target a specific uh, target that enhance plasticity, improve recovery, especially in preclinical and animal models, right? And there's just not that human translatability, right? Even when with a, a minimal clinically significant difference, right? Um, that's noted in the preclinical model, just won't translate to humans that well. But I think um, the most exciting thing about what you're studying is that you guys did like a, uh, this huge study where you looked at patients that had brain injury and you looked at patients specifically that had brain injury that had a mutation, a loss of function mutation in uh, uh, of this receptor, meaning that this receptor did not work in this sect of patients, right? And you actually found that these patients that had the mutation where their CCR5 didn't work had a much improved recovery after their brain injury. Yes, that's that's true. So that essentially de-risks the translation to human. Right. Because we know humans also who have reduced CCR5 function recover better. Right. So, um, you know what? I really wish that there was a drug and medication out there that we already had 
that would block CCR5. Which there is, which you're, uh, that was just, a, called I, a slow pitch. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm just being sarcastic. Yeah. Right, there is, right? Yeah. So yeah, so can you tell us about that? So it, it's this is an interesting line of investigation because so many things connected with it. Right. And as a, on the just pure research scientist end of things, you rarely have all of those connections yeah. come through like that. Yeah. So there was a human mutation yeah. that lo, that knocked function out, and they and we were able to test those people in a stroke trial that was ongoing right. already, and they did better. Right. And then there's a. CCR5 is the second major receptor for the HIV virus. Right. So there's a deep pharmacology to this. And there, uh, there's a drug out there that about 15% of HIV patients are on called Maraviroc. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to take that drug and see if it worked in mice for stroke recovery. Okay. Because it blocks the CCR5 receptor. It's FDA approved. Right. It's already out there. And it did. Right. And so that allowed us to move into clinical trial literally before the paper was published with the, fi the primary finding. Yeah. Repurposing drugs that are already in existence is like such a... So, such a shortcut for clinical trials, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So what are, what are the um, potential uh, applicability of this, not just in stroke or, um, or traumatic brain injury, but what about in neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease, right? We're talking about learning um, or, you know, in my patients, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy potentially. Yeah, I think there is really an uh, a, an important road to travel to find out what the effects there. Mm. So I mentioned Dr. Silva, the, uh, my collaborator, Alcino Silva. And so he has a paper in Nature this spring where he found that with aged animals paradoxically even further upregulate CCR5 in their learning, their learning systems of the brain. Mm -hmm. And if you block that, you can make aged mice, which have impaired memory, young again. They, f they have a sharp and crisp memory like they would with their younger. Let's, let's backtrack on that. You said that you can make them young again through CCR5 blockade? Through in their memory function. Right, their memory function would be that of what they a were. A younger mouse. A younger mouse. Yeah. And so there's an opportunity to think of just the cognitive dysfunction we experience with age. Where are my car keys? What was that person's name at the party? Right. There's a possibility that we could enhance that with a drug like CCR5. And Alcino is really pursuing that. Right. Now, in those, and I don't, you guys probably didn't look at this, but if we're talking about CCR5 being um, involved in learning and cognition, um, would someone with a CCR5 mutation, would they have an impaired an impairment in learning or in their cognitive function? Well, the important thing there is CCR5 is a negative regulator. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. so yeah. maybe they would be enhanced. Right. The people with the mutation have had it in utero and then all their lives. So it's likely they have compensatory systems that have kicked into gear. Okay. Like CCR3 and CCR4, which are close relatives to CCR5 and might compensate. Okay. So it's, so it's possible that if you took a human or a mouse and you knocked out CCR5, that, that the life of the animal, the, the brain or other systems would compensate. Got it. Okay. But you can't make a smarter human being by uh, genetically modifying CCR five. You might make the mem you might make their memory form better if they're no if they would normally had CCR five. Right, exactly. And then block it. Yeah, yeah. Like you know all this like uh, uh, DNA and genetic manipulation that people are doing with their with their fetuses. Yeah. Right? Like that, you wouldn't be able to do that in that case, right? Well, it's interesting you ask that because the Chinese investigator that got into trouble for using CRISPR to modify uh, two babies, the gene he knocked out was CCR5. Really? Yeah, and I that, happened, got... that happened right when our paper came out, okay. which, uh, which was in a fairly prominent journal. And so there was, you know, it's funny, there's a self-reference problem here. CCR5 prevents memory fusion, mm -hmm. fusing, mm -hmm. but those events fused. Right. And so I got a lot of calls from science reporters because here's this unethical scientific researcher in, in China who right. used CRISPR-Cas to, to mutate two babies' genomes, right. and the gene he used was CCR5, right. and we were now showing its role in stroke, right. and they came out roughly in a contemporaneous way. Okay. Did he end up... Did he find that actually deleting that gene enhanced their cognition? Or we, we, we don't we, know. We didn't get to I that think point? that's... Uh, 
I mean, uh, he was uh, disciplined and, right. and he was appropriately handled in right. China, and right. so it's unclear what happened to uh, uh, to the babies the or the whole process. The babies. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about what are some adverse effects of CCR5 blockade, or is it a panacea like everyone likes to think things are, which nothing is, right? There's always yeah. sort of like a, a balanced thing, so. I think there's some theoretical things to worry about, and one is we do uh, de-link memories. We chunk them using CCR5 so that we don't have abnormal memory fusions. Mm -hmm. And so you may worry that if you go in and start blocking this, you're going to interfere with that process. Mm. You might imagine you could have hallucinations where you start to have sensory stimuli reactivated when they're not there. Mm. Um, however, uh, HIV patients have been on this drug and not experienced those. Yeah. So we have that literature to suggest that we're probably okay here. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be any issues with memory consolidation if you start blocking CCR5? Like, um, you know, I have PTSD patients, right? There's an issue with uh, fear, memory consolidation in that context. Do you think that, you know, there might be any adverse effects there? You wonder. It, they, those are different molecular systems. Okay. Memory formation or encoding okay. versus consolidation. And so CCR5 hasn't been implicated in consolidation. Got it. But every time, it, memory's complex, and we probably don't want to go into the whole thing, but right. every time you reactivate a memory, it has to reconsolidate. It's right. unstable yeah. again once you've reactivated. It's possible you could go in and manipulate it then, maybe using a, a, a plasticity drug like CCR5. Got it. Um, what about the delivery? So you're saying... Okay, well, you know, we want to enhance plasticity and we want to enhance these functions by blocking CCR5. I'm assuming specifically in where the brain injury is, right? Like, yes. uh, are you ever worried that you know you're gonna you're gonna blockade CCR5 throughout the entire brain by administering a drug like this? That's a great question, and we have an advantage there in stroke in the sense that there is a topography right. to stroke. And CCR5 is massively upregulated near the stroke site. Okay. So it seems to be a target of, uh, of availability that's induced by stroke right. rather than having it all over the brain and being interesting and, and a plasticity mechanism, but not somehow uniquely influenced by the stroke. Yeah, yeah. That's an excellent point. Wonderful. I think that does it. Okay. I think that pretty much does it, unless there's anything else that you want to add regarding CCR5. No, no further CCR. No, let's talk about. You're doing a clinical trial, though, right yes. now, right? When is the uh, when is that going to conclude? It got hit hard by COVID, so oh. we had it going, and then you know, literally right at the pandemic. But now we're expecting two or three patients a month and, and in, in, entry, and we're start we're starting to ramp up. Okay, all right. Well, I look forward to the results of that. Hopefully, you'll give me a shout. Yeah, give me some yeah. insider information on that. Um, I look forward to potentially prescribing it to some of my patients in the. Uh, in the hopefully near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to add? Any other projects, any other research, anything else that you're doing that you'd like to you know, get out there? I think one thing you're hitting upon with all these questions is the emerging field of regenerative medicine in the mm. brain. Yeah. And it's important, I think, for the audience to understand that this is an area that hasn't been well studied. We've been focused on degeneration in the brain. Yeah. And the, and the idea of regenerating brain, enhancing plasticity is its own distinct field, sure. has its own set of biologies and drug delivery uh, systems and things like that that require uh, a lot of independent thought and consideration. But the advantage is it may span diseases. Mm -hmm. And so if you can enhance, plast like we use CCR5, if you can enhance plasticity and recovery from disease X, say mm -hmm. stroke, it may work in Alzheimer's and in other diseases. And so there's a possibility of what the physicists call string theory, the theory that unites all principles. It's right. possible that regenerative medicine can cut across many different fields of, of neuro, neurologic disease mm -hmm. and be sort of string theory for the brain. And right. I think that's exciting. Right. So what you're saying is time warp right? Bend space and time <laughs> across those different fields and just shoot across. Yeah. That the principles of repair may be disease in independent. Right. Yeah. It might be some just common mechanism that's occurring despite the kind of injury. Right? Yes. Has CCR5 been shown uh, increased in, in traumatic brain injury? It's yeah. up in traumatic brain injury. It's up in traumatic yeah. brain injury as well. What about neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's? And That I'm not aware of. You're not aware of? Okay. Well, yeah, that's good news to me. Uh -huh. Traumatic brain injury. So, yeah. um, anything else? 
Nope. That's all I uh, really Thank had. you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, that was so interesting. And I hope that, you know, when those results come back in the future, you can come back and you can tell us all about it. You bet. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you everyone uh, for joining. Dr. Uh, Stanley Carmichael, thank you so much. Chair of Neurology here at UCLA. Uh, certainly an accomplished researcher uh, in stem cells and um, brain injury and uh, brain injury rehab. Um, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Carmichael, um, please uh, email the email below. And if it's okay with you, oh, yeah. I'll forward it on to you and maybe you can answer some questions and yep, different things like that. So. Does that work? All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. But most importantly, stay safe. Be well.